I will begin All right. Well, hello and welcome to the Manfred Olson series called Under African Skies. This is our fourth program in this whole series. And I'm very happy to have Tarek El Gamal talk to us about his home country, Egypt. Now, before, before we, we get into the particulars of, of this country, we are going to get into the mood and transfer ourselves from a dark, not too cold, but a, certainly a dark day evening in Milwaukee, we're going to go to the African continent. pleasure to introduce Tarek El Gamal, who is in fact a UWM alum. He finished his degree in engineering and now is working for the Bradley Corporation as a design engineer. I would like to thank him again for, thank you very much for being here today. We are so looking forward to a tour of Egypt. Thanks, Jean, for this. Go ahead. Uh, Okay, thanks everybody for coming in and uh, I hope you are gonna enjoy this little journey. So Egypt is, uh, as you can see in the picture right now, it's uh, at the upper right corner of Africa. So it's totally affiliated to this continent. Looking closely to Egypt, you can see it's bounded by two seas. Uh, up north, it's the Mediterranean Sea and on the right side, there's the Red Sea. But also it's uh, having uh, uh, neighbors around. You can find on the west side, you can find Libya. Uh, below Egypt, there is Sudan. Both of them are Arab countries, but I will add up for Sudan. We are sharing the River Nile, so we have a different level of brotherhood. From the eastern side, we have Palestine, Israel, Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have a peace treaty with Israel uh, in, since 1979. And we have also alliance and collaboration level with the Arab countries. I want to highlight the one with Jordan that we are having a free visa tourism policy. All right, which means you can just freely visit each other without too much, without, without too much hassle, right? True. Um, we we decided to focus on specific areas, and it's it's uh, wonderful to me that you are from Cairo, that you spend a lot of your life from one of the biggest cities in the whole world. Tell us about what is it like to live in a place with 20 million people? Uh, right, Jean, like uh, I have been born and raised in Cairo. Cairo was built in 969 and it's the largest uh, city in the Middle East population wise. As you mentioned, it's 20 million people, so congested. You can expect lots of traffic jam, but at this, on the pro side, 
you can find people are connected together. There is a lot of uh, connection and uh, uh, heart, uh, heartwarming uh, connection between people. So we are totally meshed together. My personal memories about this is so many levels. It's like playing soccer in the alleys of, of my neighborhood, uh, sharing the, the class bench with my best friends ever, the people that I usually, when I go to Egypt, for, see, see them first. So it's something that I will never forget. I am always connected to my uh, city, Cairo. Yeah, it is. That must be a really special, a special connection, as you said. Um, of course, we all know that the River Nile has been, uh, what to say, crucial for the history of Egypt. Tell us about your connection to this, this, uh, this river. Again, yes, as you mentioned, it's very crucial. It's actually considered in Egypt as the life artery, uh, where every city, almost like every city, and the population of Egypt are concentrated around the two sides of the River Nile. Uh, Egypt started as an agricultural country, and the Egyptian civilization started around the River Nile. Me personally, has my, I have my own memories, and I would say something like taking a cruise in the, on the River Nile and running my hands through its water is something I can't forget. I can't take it out of my head at all. Wow. Yeah, I, I'm just hoping that um, maybe the next year you and maybe some of us can experience that. Let's, let's just see. Now, a very different kind of terrain on the western side of the country, closer to the desert, is this oasis. And I understand that it's very much an outdoors paradise for whoever um, can get there. Right. Uh, Siwa Oasis is actually one of the most touristic places uh, you should be visiting when you come to Egypt. Uh, actually, this place, it's an oasis, so like it has hot springs that can be used for treatment and remedy tourism. Uh, but also it has sand dunes and uh, the nomads there are very hospitable to the extent that you're going to be having camping, safari time with them, sand surfing with them. Uh, Another level of tourism is rock climbing. It's surrounded by some mountains, so you can go there and have some entertainment. And also at night, it's a great place for stargazing. So yes. I, would, I would say it's like naturally shaped for tourism. Yeah, yeah. Even internal tourism, right? I imagine that a lot of Egyptians visit. Uh, yes, I would say so. Um, okay, so the flag color scheme we see around your neck, right? So this, tell us about the significance of the colors um, of the flag of Egypt. Okay, the, at the beginning, this is, yes, as you mentioned, this is my sash colored with my flag, uh, my country's flag colors. Uh, I have had it in my graduation ceremony. I'm so proud of it. Uh, the colors starting from the top, the red one is actually uh, representing the sacrifices of the martyrs. Going down to the middle, why it means peaceful or Egypt is a peaceful country. So it symbolizes the peace. Going down to the black color, uh, which also stands for the hard time that Egypt has gone through, like worship, worship time or uh, occupation times. Mm -hmm. Going back to the middle, you will find the golden falcon. And this represents the strength of the country, uh, but also its affiliation to the Arab world. Below it, you can find uh, uh, an Arabic word called Gumhuriyat Masr al Arabiya, which means in English, uh, the Arab Republic of Egypt. All right. Now, uh, we, I, I grew up in Greece, so for me, cotton is is one of the well, my preferred my preferred um, fiber. So I know how wonderful Egyptian cotton is. Please tell us about your um, your gold. <laughs> Thanks for mentioning gold. So in Egypt, we consider the Egyptian cotton as the white gold because it's a very national treasure to us. Why is that? It's because its fibers are long and intact. So you can have like uh, clothes and fabrics uh, in very long seamless. 
at the same time, the fibers are very, uh, uh, very soft to the extent that you can have like the fabrics like run your hands on them and you will find nothing like as smooth and comfy as it as the Egyptian cotton fabrics. Yeah, I should I, I should put in an order for pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> They are, they are usually, like, yes, that's true. Usually some pajamas are made from uh, Egyptian cotton and they are really comfy and they are so expensive. Yeah. Just saying this, when I get into a store and find, like, some clothes tags that me that mentions uh, Egyptian cotton, usually I want to, like, shout out, like, guys, I'm from Egypt. This is something <laughs> about my country. So I'm so proud of it all, all the time, like, when I see these tags. Right, right. Of course you are. Um, now, we know the importance of Ramadan in the Islamic world, and uh, uh, Muhammad gave us a little, uh, he gave us a flavor of what that's like in Algeria. So you perhaps can focus on this holy month that begins with the crescent moon. How is it different in Egypt? Well, uh, as Muhammad mentioned before, Ramadan is a holy month in the Muslim world, including Algeria and Egypt. It starts with uh, a crescent and ends with a crescent. So it takes like 29 to 30 days. And it, it's about starting fasting during the sunrise, which is about like, let's say 4 a.m. Uh, and breaking fast uh, during the sunset. Sometimes it's around 7 or 8 p.m. I'm talking about like U.S. here at this time. So like yeah summer times and it's shifting right now towards winter times because usually there is a difference between the lunar calendar and the gregorian calendar by 11 days so uh looking at this slide here you can find some lanterns on the right side which is a good decoration for our holy months so you can find it on the streets you can buy them for your kids also you can find this uh fruit which is dates it's a very common dessert during this month Mm -hmm. And it's, of course, a great uh, time for, for gatherings. True. So just think about it as the Thanksgiving being stretched to 30 days. <laughs> so I don't think can... my waistline can handle 30 days of Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Like, yeah, food wise, it's it's an amazing thing. It's a carnival of food. So you can find like very special special food and desserts. But also you are, you are inviting your family your extended family, your friends, even strangers, sometimes like people who are passing by and the time of sunset came and you tell them like you have to breakfast with us and you start conversation and you make new friends or new people around you. Also another level of uh, communication and connection uh, is the religious part of Ramadan. Uh, it's not only about fasting, but also it's doing some religious practices like the praying at night, which goes like for uh, an hour or two. Uh, people are stacked next to each other with almost no gaps. They pray and they talk and they are connected to each other in a good way. The third level of amazing things is the decorations. As you can see from the left picture or even from the right picture, the, the bottom one, you see lanterns, which is called in Arabic fanus, or you see some decorations on the streets. People, neighbors, like just communicate about this. We are going to have an electricity from your side, we're gonna illuminate this lantern, we're gonna connect this decoration from your balcony to our balcony, all in amazing way of collaboration. Yeah, now I imagine that changes need to be made, uh, these celebrations because of COVID, right? Right, so for example, like uh, praying in mosques right now is being halted for the safety of people and it's highly recommended and urged to have just get together for your close family. Yeah, we all have had to make adjustments. Now we get to talk about my oh favorite, God. which is food. <laughs> and uh, I don't think I've heard anybody speak so eloquently about breakfast the way you do. So take it away, Tarek. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jean. Well, you're not the only person who likes food. I'm, I am too, <laughs> especially my Egyptian food, which I am going to start with the breakfast one. And I am going to start also with the one in the middle, which is called Ful Midamis. That's in Arabic or Egyptian style. Here in the US, it's called Fava Beans. 
it's kind of like brown beans that's being cooked on the stove and some seasoning to be added to it, like uh, salt and pepper, cumin, tahini sauce, olive oil, some tomatoes and some uh, lemon. Uh, it's very delicious and it's the kick of the, of the day, I would say. Like if you don't have this, you're losing your main, f- main fuel of your day. So it's very important. You can't go without full mudamis. So that's something important. And you have a prop for us. Right. Let me show you this one. So actually this one here, I know if there's lots of lights around it, but if you can see here, this is the fava beans. And actually there's some wording here called fava beans, Egyptian recipe. So that's also different from one country to another. It's sold in cans. You just open it and cook it, and then you add some seasoning if you want to. Nice. Now, I know what a falafel is, but there's a twist. Right. So our falafel uh, is called tameya in in Egypt, and it's made actually from fava beans, not from chickpeas like other countries. So the fava beans are being ground and mixed with some vegetables to make a dough and these doughs are made into bowls to be fried and make the tamaya. So tamaya actually goes hand in hand with the fava beans to make a very delicious breakfast in the morning. All right, but there's a third choice here. The, this, the one on the left side, it's the playmaker of all times of the day. So this guy, you can eat it in the breakfast time or at lunch or even at uh, dinner time. It's called koshari. And it's a, a vegan mix of rice, lentil, uh, pasta, uh, chickpeas, fried onions, and tomato sauce. You can make it spicy by adding some chili sauce. And again, you can eat it at any time. It's so satisfying. It's like very delicious. You can't visit Egypt and you can't eat from like, you can't eat kosher from any of the restaurants that are open 24 seven. Right, right. Now, you've already mentioned that we have very good choices for any time of the day already, but if we wanted to add some variety, we have what looks here a little bit like a turkey. Yep, and there is another twist here. It's not turkey. It it could be duck or it could be a pigeon. So the same idea like turkey here, we have ducks and pigeons more common than turkey and we stuff them and we uh, cook them in the oven to make it like pretty delicious and pretty attractive like this one in the slide. Right. Uh, and it's a different kind of bird meat. So when you try it, I, I would say, you will not forget the turkey, but you will add something into your list to eat again. <laughs> okay, other yeah. or options. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. So, Going in the same picture and going up, there is some kind of uh, mixed rice. So we get some part of the rice and we fry it a little until it's golden-like and we mix it back to the white rice. So we call it roasted and falafel, which is mixed golden and white rice. And rice is also another playmaker. You can find it like in anything. You can find it as a stuffing in this kind of ducks. You can stuff some vegetables. You can have it as a separate plate. You can mix it with some like soup things. Right. So exactly as you show here, we have vegetables that are stuffed with rice. And I love the way that the zucchini is there, the green peppers and the cool kind of eggplant, which isn't the the kind, the big purpley here, but the but the more subtle in color. So that's another way to introduce rice. Now, did you also mention that you could put rice with the soup that you have on the far right? Right. So the one on the far right, it's called Molokheya. You can find it here in US as a Jew Malu. Uh, this is a green soup that's usually uh, having the vegetables to be cut and uh, mix it with a chicken or meat broth. And then also you can add some uh, fried uh, garlic. You can have it as a soup, you can mix it with rice. It's very delicious and you're gonna enjoy every like, you know, sip of it. I just hope that the people who are with us have had some dinner because I think otherwise they might be in trouble. (laughs) (laughs) So now that we have uh, filled our belly, at least uh, virtually, let's look at the many kinds of 
styles that have influenced uh, the art in Egypt. So, Starting, of course, with ancient Egypt. Right. So Egypt has been through different waves of civilizations, starting, of course, with ancient Egypt, as you mentioned, Jean. Uh, they were pretty good with arts, and like arts was them, for them was like having different faces. Talking about the architecture, they got like large rocks, they shaped it into blocks, and they slide them together and stack them upwards to make this unique shape like a pyramid. But also like sometimes like when you get you get into a huge rock in the site and the, you say like, yeah, this is ugly. Let's like sculpture it to something good. And you end up with making the Sphinx, which is one of the amazing architecture ever and sculpture ever. Right. On, on the right and the bottom side, you can also see some type of sculpturing for having the full body of the pharaohs and also recording the history uh, of, of the civilization. For example, the one on the bottom, it's actually showing King Mina while he is getting into the war to uh, unite Egypt, the upper side and the lower side of Egypt and make them one whole country. Mm -hmm. I must say that I'm, I'm really struck by how the Egyptian artwork on the right influenced early Greek art. Even the foot that is front, like exactly the style entirely was copied, the hair, everything. Um, it's interesting how the two civilizations spoke to each other and influenced each other over time. After all, um, there was a, a, a long and serious Greek and Roman presence in Egypt. True. And I would say, yes, they, they were connected in a good way. Actually, when the Greek and the Roman empires came in, uh, came in into Egypt and took Alexandria as their center of like their civilization, they did something smart. Actually, they built they built temples very close to the Egyptian style, so they start to bring people into the idea that like yeah, we are connected to you guys, like we are on the same level of humanity, and the same thing of artistic level. And that was really good, and then they introduced theirs. That's something we are also proud of, like something like the one on the left here. It's the amphitheater, the Greek amphitheater in Alexandria. The one on the right, it's certain type of painting about an upper class Roman lady. And that's something they were adding up to our artistic level or artistic uh, pot. You know, we are mixing all arts together. Yes. And eventually, of course, Islamic arts became... Um kind of the, the name of the game. Um, so tell us a little bit about some of these features that are really stereotypical, if you will, um, Islamic, these beautiful arches and things. Uh, right, so as you mentioned, so whenever you come to Cairo, especially because that was the center of the Islamic uh, civilization, and that's like usually the mid ages, we're talking about like uh, the year of thousands around this, they started to build mosques with arches or the rooftops like domes type. And they built also like the minarets, the, the, the long towers that looks amazing from the outside. Also like if you are decorating it from the inside with like spiral stairs and stuff like this, you're gonna enjoy the architecture from the inside and the outside. But also they have taken this into different kinds of uh, arts. So the lanterns that we were talking about in uh, Ramadan slide, it's also shaped or made actually from the Islamic civilizations during ages. On the right side, there is something really interesting. This is actually a peacock, but it's made from words and Arabic letters. So you usually read this and you get yourself like interested in the art and the meaning of the words. Yeah. Calligraphy is such a wonderful art form. This is a bit more avant-garde and more modern. <laughs> Tell us about this. Yes, modern, age, modern ages also has its own diversity of arts, but I want to highlight this one especially because this one started to be prominent since 2011 during the Arab springtime and the Egyptian revolution time. And it's highly influenced by the political situation. So Looking at these two pictures here, the one on the left, it's the Vendetta mask over the Pharaonic mask, which is a symbol of like the resistance. 
And also the same thing on the right side, you can see the Nefertiti uh, mask, like also having like a gas mask because like we want to rebuild. Even like, yeah, we are pharaohs. We are coming from ancient Egypt. We, they have done amazing things and we can do the same. That's kind of the mentality that like went through our minds during this time. Right. So this kind of art is actually called graffiti. So since then, since 2011, graffiti started to be like very prominent in Egypt. I see. Uh, let's look at, at buildings um, rather than focusing on public buildings, we probably want to look more at, you know, different dwellings that regular people live in. And let's start close to the Mediterranean. Right. So starting from the top, which is called the Lower Egypt. And actually, when you go down, you go uphill. So you call it Upper Egypt. That's a pretty interesting thing about Egypt. It's going upside down. <laughs> uh, but starting from the top, which is called the Delta area, it's a very green area, lots of farms. And uh, the main thing is agricultural there. So people usually own their houses and they built it up, actually. And they usually are surrounded by their farms. That's why you find the houses are like one or two stories with open rooftop and separated from each other. And they collect their families there. So even if you get married, you usually come with your uh, spouse and live with your family. Now, does normally the woman go and live with the, with the man's family or is it the other way around or does it change from according to the situation? Uh, mostly in these areas, it's the woman goes to the man's family. I'm just curious. Um, okay, back to Cairo, back, back to the big city. Now we see an interesting, uh, what, what that looks like. Um, tell us more. Again, my city, Cairo. Like, you see this picture here, and, like, all I think of, like, these like high buildings of like, let's say five or six floors. Lots of like many of these floors actually also has like five or sometimes 10 apartments inside. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the streets are usually congested like during the daytime. They're like pretty much emptier when it's get to nighttime, of course. But all of that, when you are thinking about like traffic jam or like congested city and all these stuff, uh, you don't see it like as a bad thing all the time. You make actually the society is much more collective and thinking about you're thinking about your neighbors in a very personal and uh, societal levels. So you can find also dailies downstairs, like just like go pick your stuff. You don't have to go and drive far to a big supermarket or something. Everything is accessible. Everything is 24 seven. People are so much connected together. Yeah. I want to add up something quickly, if you don't mind. Oh, about... go ahead, go ahead. I want to actually show a very small item here. Ah. It's, called... <laughs> it's called Tok Tok, and it's like three-wheeled uh, part. This this actually uh, artwork, I got it from a friend from Pakistan, but it's also, also very common in Egypt, and it's working well for the personal transportation uh, or public also transportation uh, inside the alleys because like it's very like good with maneuvers and stuff right right and small <laughs> narrow <is>. yes <laughs> um one more a location that certainly has a very colorful outlook yes going all the way down to the upper egypt so <laughs> this part it's aswan city and uh it's amazing place actually when you go there and as you can see also River Nile crosses the city and take just the cruise there, see these buildings. These buildings are also houses like stacked next to each other. There's no gaps, pretty colorful as you can see. So you can find white, all white houses and all colorful places like this. Amazing place, people there are so generous and they will invite you to their place to try their food and stay with them like for a couple of days. Wow. Wow, so magnificent people, um, obviously, friendly. Um, we're gonna look at, um, we're gonna look at the general population first and then we're gonna focus on some of your heroes. Tell us about the people of Egypt. 
Okay, well, Egypt is actually, as you see in this slide, they are all Egyptians. We are gonna just like subcategorizing them into different communities or different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So starting with the people in the middle, the top and the bottom uh, pictures, they are representing the people in the city. And as you can see, they are wearing t-shirts, jeans or shirts, and some of them are head, like having head scarves. Some of them are just like losing their hair. That's fine. Uh, but also going away from the city and going to the right picture, people in the village or rural areas, they are having different style of outfits that it's convenient to their work in farming. So they uh, wear something called galabeya. And uh, as you can see, it's one long dress, so easy and comfy for them to work for farming or even staying at home. Going all the way to the left, and we see two different kinds of communities. The one, uh, the upper one, it's called, they are called Bedouins. They are nomads who are living in Siwa Oasis, as we mentioned at the beginning, or Sinai area. Uh, they have, like besides Arabic, they have another language. Uh, they communicate with each other. They love to live in tribes and uh, they are very, very kind and hostile and they will invite you to all sorts of fun they have. The same thing goes for the lower picture, the Nubian people who are living in Aswan and lower, uh, lower side of Egypt, which is called Upper Egypt again. <laughs> uh, as you can see, their outfit is also like a Galabea style, like the one on the right side, but it's all white. It has a very good contrast with their skin color. It's pretty amazing. These people like pretty kind and they can have you in their colorful houses again. Wow. Wow. So we're gonna look at some of the famous people in, um, in Egypt and you can choose. Um, I, even, I even recognize one of them uh, on my own. Right, we have talked about this gene. So I'm gonna start from uh, the top left side. Uh, the first guy actually with the dark glasses, uh, he's called Taha Hussein. He's a blind guy, but he is actually titled as the Dean of Arabic lit lit Literature. And this man is the leader of the Renaissance of like the modern type of literature in Egypt. So starting from the 1900s, he boosted the literature in, into a different direction, especially about the realism and talking about people. His short stories and novels are really, really into the people, the poor class especially, and how they are suffering. As you can see actually from his novels, The Sufferers, it's actually talking about people who had suffered from poverty, disease, or illiteracy, something that like at this time, it was like a big deal. He was nominated actually for Nobel Prize 14 times. But wow. luckily, like he didn't get any of them. Well, uh, but Mafus did. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> right. So we got it. We were lucky to have Nagib Mahfouz to get it. Another great uh, literature, uh, uh, great literature, Arabic, Arabic literature person. So this man is amazing with his novels and he's a leader of symbolism and existentialist novels in Egypt. Uh, he has so many great novels that were translated into so many languages, especially the one that uh, next to his picture, it's called uh, the Cairo Trilogy. I, I remember you have read it, Jean, right? Yes, I read the trilogy I re and, and I highly recommend these books. They, they're beautiful to read and you really feel like you've been transported to a different place. And I, I, I really enjoy it. So I, I I recommend um, freely, please. This is great to put it put it on your holiday list if 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 you're looking for ideas. Yes. It. Now we have a woman uh, as one of your heroes, and uh, I I'll say I haven't told you this before. My son, who's taking a, a course in history of the Middle East, said, "Oh, I saw." We, we talked about her in class. So she clearly is a, a, a civilization symbol. Um, so tell us about Kalthum. Yes, Om Kalthum, actually, she is the leader of the romantic songs at her time, the female romantic songs, I would say. Because like, starting from the 1940s up to the 1970s, she was like 
the prominent star of the romantic songs. Uh, she revolutionized the whole thing, the lyrics, the, the songs, and she used to have like her songs uh, being released monthly. So people literally were waiting on, like uh, on pins and needles for ev every time for this, like, and she went to Paris and other like countries, she made her tours and people like from different countries, Arab countries, even in, uh, like other foreign countries, they were appreciating her strong voice and also like how she goes from different like uh, song to another in a very amazing way. Um Kalsum, it's it's a role model for so many people right now, men and women. Wow. Let's hear a song from her. <laughs> your national anthem written by this musician. Right. So Said Darwish, the one at the left bottom, uh, he's a composer and also songwriter. Uh, and he also one of the great leaders of the modern music in Egypt. Even though he was unlucky to live long, he died at the age of 31. He was uh, actually moving our hearts and lifting our spirit, especially during the time of the British occupation at this time and how we were trying to rebuild. So his songs were, was always about like uh, rebel and resistance and lifting spirits, ending with his amazing national anthem thing. Okay. <laughs> Here is another Nobel Prize. This is a, a prize now in chemistry. Zawail um, is an Egyptian and he managed to use lasers to photograph microscopic things at the Fenty second level. That is a million of a nanosecond. Um, and that meant that he could look at chemical reactions as they happen sort of step by step. That's pretty awesome. Yes, I'm so proud of him. He, he used to be the professor uh, of chemistry in Caltech and uh, his work was like, he is actually titled also as the father of the femto chemistry because of his achievement. Uh, and like, it was like the breaking through different kind of science or different level of science and in the chemistry level, of course. Uh, looking into this in depth, that helped a lot on, of understanding how compounds are being like broken down and even like made again and stuff like this. And that helped the medicine industry a lot. Right. We need more such geniuses. Um, the series always includes a piece about how you're connected, you and your civilization or your culture, I should say, is connected to stars. And I find it kind of, I don't know, cool, interesting that almost every speaker had a real personal connection and you are not an exception. Tell us how you are connected to stars directly, Tarek. Well, okay, I'm gonna start with my personal one and then I will go to the cultural one or the societal one. So uh, me personally, my name is actually is the story here. So Tarek actually has different meanings, but one of them means the roving star that like pierces the space fabric. 
So since my birth, since I was given my name, I'm connected to the stars. I look at them and I say like, yes, I see you stars. I am totally into you. (laughs) Great. But there's also a societal way of using the word star. Right. So uh, I would say uh, the star thing, when we say like, hey star or hey superstar, this actually means like, we are saying your highness, but we say it to your close friends usually. So this is kind of communication between close friends and people who are very close to you and say like somebody who comes in, hey star, how's it going buddy? So (laughs) this is one good way when we say it like this way. It's appreciation to close friends and people around you. Yeah, I I really like that. Um, So here is of course the star we know best, the sun. And you have a cool story about this. So uh, as we were discussing this gene, like our son, like to our kids and like our childhood times, uh, it's the tooth fairy to us. So (laughs) when we have like a a tooth that's falling down, we usually hold it and we throw it away towards the sun, up, up high towards the sun. And we sing this song, which says in Arabic, which means in English, hey, beautiful son, please take our like fallen down and uh, unlucky tooth and please bring us the bride's tooth, which is fresh, clean tooth. So it, it's very amazing. It's, I know it's, it's nothing related to the belief, but it's something related to the kids' like good memories. Right, right. Um, and this is, of course, a bright star. Right. That's when we say, like, hey, star again, and to our friends. Yep. Now, you've already mentioned the moon has a particular significance in establishing the calendar, like, for example, when Ramadan is. Um, tell us more about how the moon is used in sort of daily conversation. It's, it's really interesting, Jean, because, like, the different figures of moons also like symbolizes different stories or different things to us. So for example, as the slide shows here, it's a crescent time. And besides Ramadan thing, it's also like we have this saying when somebody also shows up in a place, we say or in English, like you showed up like a crescent. Mm. So this means like you are showing like in a very bright, amazing way and giving us a great vibe, like you are illuminating the place. And also the full moon, when it's like totally full and brightening the whole place, we're also using it in a romantic way and describing the beauty of somebody like you are beautiful as a full moon. Wow, I can get behind that. Now we know that many people around the world understood the path of the sun in detail. And of course the Egyptians did this too. So tell us about how in this temple for Ramses II, it was constructed so that something special happens only twice a year. Right. And that was like a pretty smart thing from the ancient uh, Egypt civilization. So the people at this time, they were understanding the solar path and the solar times uh, where it's going to be located uh, on these days. And they built this Abu Simbel temple uh, in Aswan actually, to be directed in a way that two days in the whole year, the sun gets into the entrance and illuminates the statues in front of you. So these days are actually uh, October 22nd and February 22nd. And those days are marking the King's Ramses II, his birth and his coronation. Right. And this was built in 1300 BCE, right? Right. So they had that technology and wherewithal. It is amazing. As are you, Tarek. I'd like to thank you again. We will have chance for, for questions, uh, but I, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and taking us there taking us to your beautiful country. I'd also like to thank Victoria Robison who coordinates a lot of the technical issues of the program. And 
like to also thank uh, the College of Letters and Science and the Center for Gravitation, Cosmology and Astrophysics for their support of our programming. We do have a couple of questions that I'd like to ask you and then uh, we'll see. Um, <laughs> we'll see a couple of people have been saying that our presentation made them very hungry. Um, so, <laughs> um, so why don't uh, we talk a little bit about what you miss most about Egypt? Oh my God, that's a good question. Especially when I say that I haven't been there since 2016. So it has been like four years. So first it's definitely my family and close friends and when we're going back again about the slides, uh, the vibe of Ramadan, it's something that like I actually, like when I went the last, like the last two years I have been there in 2014 and 15, I was targeting Ramadan there because like, I want to have this vibe and it like lifts your spirit, feel like different things that you miss all the time during work and stuff. And then this month come into your heart directly hits your heart. Food things, of course. I, I can't like, I, I will never stop talking about food because like the two <laughs> slides there, they are amazing, but there is lots of other types of food and dishes that we haven't talked about. Right. So it's a combination of different things. Right. Well, you, you certainly give us a, a nice collection of things that you miss that we can relate to. What's your favorite place to visit? I would say uh, Aswan because like Aswan, uh, again, it has different mix of different things like ancient Egypt civilization, like the temples and other uh, architecture you can see and statues, they are pretty amazing there. You should be visiting like Abu Simbel Temple, Karnak Temple in Luxor, which is not far away from Aswan. Mm -hmm. You can go for a safari because like the desert is like not pretty far from the city. You can take a cruise in the Nile and see the rocks there. They are pretty good and like having a good natural uh, scene but also you can see the houses and maybe actually jump from the boat, go to these houses to meet the people, to stay there and have like a very, very amazing stay there with these kind of people, food and colorful scene. That sounds like a recipe for success. Um, where I'm going to um, look at questions that people might have. I just want to point out that this is our fourth uh, program and we have one more next week. Uh, Dr. Otiano is going to tell us about her country, Kenya. Let's see what questions we have uh, from our audience. Uh, people are excited to learn more about Egypt tonight, says Suzanne. And um, so there is a question. Are there any ways that you see Egyptian color, culture, excuse me, being misappropriated? What does diversity mean to you? Those are oh. two questions. So the first question is, are there any ways that you see Egyptian culture being misappropriated? Mm, I think it's, it's the whole region of, uh, I don't wanna get it like so political or something, but like the whole region of Middle East, is misinterpreted so many times. So I'm not gonna exclude Egypt from the same thing. Uh, politically somehow like, or the politics like screwed up the whole situation there. Uh, yeah. So uh, something specifically uh, that we are having hatred to people or like some of our neighbors, which is not the thing. So uh, we are actually looking for uh, more peace again it's part of our colors in the flag so yeah. we're looking for a peaceful area that's what we are trying to do most of the time diversity means a lot because like uh, sorry uh, egypt itself like it's a part of the different regional places mm -hmm. like it's part of the african continent it's part of the arab world it's part of uh the middle east uh so it has like different kinds of collaborations with different kinds of countries, even those who are not speaking our language or our culture. We used at certain times when, when Egypt was kind of like prosperous country, I'm talking like about like the 40s and the 50s time, uh, people from Greece and other countries, uh, they were coming to us to live there. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. So we, and Italy, yeah, and like, you know, so we were accepting people from different cultures and regions. Yeah. So in fact, we, I knew some, a woman this way. She, she grew up in Alexandria and I think she spoke five languages. She, she became a professional translator because she could speak Greek and English and Arabic and French and one more, which I don't recall now, but that kind of thing was fairly common um, in the Greek community that you, you got to speak lots of languages because you needed to speak to all your neighbors, whatever, wherever they were from. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, Suzanne is asking, so that was a question from Anik Ruiz and, and Cheryl Amir. Uh, would, you te- uh, would you tell us more about the languages spoken in Egypt? Okay, well, Arabic is, the Egyptian Arabic is actually the one that's being spoken most of the time. Actually, like, because again, we said like all of them are Egyptian, even those who are speaking another language like uh, the nomads or the Bedouin or even the Nubian people, they can still speak Arabic. Just talking about like the first foreign language, it's English. And the second foreign language is French. Mm -hmm. Uh, They are not so much into the society, like the daily practices, you will never like speak in English and French. But like, again, when the situation matters for a different like second language, people can still communicate, especially around the touristic areas, of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, Are there local restaurants? Now, this is Tiffany is asking this question, and I don't know if you can answer this, but are there local restaurants that serve Egyptian food that you would recommend? Oh, my God. If she is going there soon, like I will give her a long list. (laughs) Never ending one. Well, no, I believe the local. Like here, I think, in, in this Ooh. area in Milwaukee. That's the that's the unhappy unhappy side of the story. Usually the Egyptian food are not found here so much in Milwaukee. You can have you have to drive to Chicago a little bit mm. or to go to Michigan. So there are some places in uh, Dearborn or uh, Detroit in Michigan and some places also in Chicago, Illinois, I can recommend. Uh, I think there is a place in Chicago called Semiramis. I haven't been there, but I think it's serving some of the Egyptian dishes, like especially the koshari one and things they serve there. Okay, Uh, good. Now, how does the climate compare with Milwaukee, asks uh, Joanne. (laughs) Oh my God, (laughs) okay. A little different, I imagine, just a little different. Uh, I think, we well i will bring this truth to you guys uh we almost like have no snow in our lives mm-hmm. i the only time i have heard about snow was one like two times one time from my father who lived in like uh the lower egypt which is actually up north and uh, he told me that was actually in the 60s or something and then when i left egypt in 2014 alexandria uh had like some snow but like it's kind of like snow drizzles that like melts right away so speaking about this the temperature in egypt is kind of like good temperature it's temperate compared to here there is no extreme temperatures uh, as in here in milwaukee for example so uh summertime it's pretty hot you definitely get get yourself ready to get so much tanned that's something <laughs> i have to say uh cold times it's cold uh, I'm talking about something over 32, but because of like here, compared to here, we have like lighter clothes and uh, the walls are not as uh, heated or insulated. So we may actually experience some cold more than here. I have to say this, even though there is no snow, even though there is no extreme weather, cold was, but we are still feeling cold sometimes. Right. You have, to, you have to dress like multiple layers. Because there could be houses that don't have heating. Is that possible? Uh, they usually don't have heating. Yeah. Do, yeah. yeah. Well, that that'll that that hurts if it's forty degrees outside. Oh yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Um, let's see. I have another question from Cheryl Amir. Uh, what ethnicity would Egyptians be considered? Hmm. I think that's. I don't have an exact number or something about it like i don't have percentage of stuff like this but it's mixed also like because like at the beginning there are some ancient egypt 
like ethnicity things. So I would say if we are considering them as Egyptians, that's one thing, but people also came from the Greek and the Roman empires. There was uh, Arab world domination. So people from the, especially the Asian side from uh, the Arab world also like came in. So it's a mix. Uh, I would say, I, I can't have like an exact percentage about this. Sorry, Mayor, but like, I don't have an exact answer for it. Yeah, it's complicated as the world often is. Uh, there's a nice mix. Um, so we have a, a question from Evan. As a student with also origins overseas, as my parents lived in Barbados while I was born in the States, I found myself wondering about the cultural exchanges of customs and if you experienced it. Okay. Well, again, that's part of the diversity thing. Uh, if we're talking about Egypt, because like you are the superior Egyptian there, like you're gonna be giving people your culture. Usually you learn some stuff from them, but like, again, you are the loaded person and like you can give things. When, when I came in here, of course, it's, it's, it's more for me like to get used to different cultures, not just like the American culture, but also like international students around me. And I had friends from Latin America. I had friends from uh, Asia, other, other countries from Africa. Uh, not so many Europeans, to be honest. I have met like a couple of Germans or stuff like this. So... It's, it's all about understanding what kind of background that they come from and why they are doing their customs. What does it mean to them? So that's what I try to uh, follow when, 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 when I treat people here most of the time is, is the diversity part. Has anything changed with me in my customs and habits? I, I think I did, but like, I can't track it. Like, I think people have to tell me that, yeah, you have it changed in one way or another. Yeah, I found, I tell you what I found. Um, I found that I've gotten quieter. I'm not as loud as I used to be. I'm not as opinionated as I used to be. I mean, that might be with age, of course, mm -hmm. but I think that when you are in somebody else's home, let's call it, I think you you become a little a little quieter because you start noticing oh they don't do it the way I do oh okay okay that's that's cool I totally agree with you about this part to be honest and uh, if that's so uh, I, I I like I would say being quieter. Love driving, I would say, because like here it's like uh, not congested as in Egypt. Like if you go to Egypt, like you will definitely will not like to drive. <laughs> so it's I know it's not the real custom, but like, you know, it's something you will try to avoid in Egypt. Just like get into a bus or somebody else like drives you. It's going to be much better. Uh, accepting people as they are is, is something really interesting. You don't you don't change people because like it's your culture or you are not expecting Egypt uh, sorry it, like other people to change to your Egyptian style. Mm. So that's something I would say I have changed it for that. Um, accepting pe people's food, that's amazing. I have tried different people's food and I actually as a custom right now I love to make sushi and other things and usually I look for some recipes from different countries. So. Good, good. Well, you've said you've made a real case that you're a real food foodie. So I'm glad that you're playing with a with a broad repertoire. Um, there is a comment here about how the picture. Uh, so John says the picture of the peacock also could be an illusion. It also looks like an elephant with a trunk as the peacock's neck. So I guess people play with this, with the shape and imagine mm -hmm. visualize it differently. You know what, whatever shape or like an animal you can figure, it's all yours. It's your imagination and please go for it. That's, I think that's the beauty of the calligraphy that we were talking about. You can, you can shape whatever you want with just words and things together and letters working together to give you a good artistic shape. Right. Um, 
Well, it looks like we've come to the top of the hour. Um, and I, I really think this was wonderful and fun. And I appreciate Tarek very much your presentation. I think our guests also enjoyed it as well. So thank you again. And um, I hope you have a good evening and I hope everyone can join us next week for the last uh, program of this series under African skies where we'll hear more about Kenya. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jean. Thanks for everybody. Thanks a lot.